Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new segment here on Downforce Racing uh, called What About? And um, I will have several guests, uh, including part of the Downforce Racing crew as well. And I'm very pleased to welcome alongside me for this very first episode our F1 and W Series editor, and most recently became our social media manager. Uh, welcome, Emma Butterworth, to What About? Evening, Emma. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. But obviously, there's some, uh, there's a few whatabouts we do need to talk about. And um, obviously, we'll get on to the Austrian and the Styrian Grand Prix. Obviously, uh, the hashtag was one that threw everyone a curveball when it was officially announced by Formula One themselves. And I think the pair of us went, that was a bit of a faux pas. But first, what about is... Fernando Alonso returning to uh, Renault uh, DP World F1 team for 2021, partnering um, Esteban Ocon following Daniel Ricciardo's departure to McLaren following the domino effect that Carlos Sainz has made in the driver market since yeah. partnering with Charles Leclerc <laughs> for, for next year. Um, but there's quite a few reasons why he has returned to Renault. So what about it, Emma? Well, it's it's a strange one, isn't it? Because I think with the driver market being so open, um, you know, over the past few months, um, we all kind of knew he would return to Renault. But the question I'm asking myself is whether he should return to Renault. That is the big question. But when he actually left Formula One back at the end of 2018, um, he said, and I quote, achieved more in F1 than I ever dreamed of and it's time to achieve bigger things outside of Formula One. Um, so at that time I know that he had, um, he was wanting to compete in the Le Mans 24 hour. He's also done some uh, Dakar rally as well. Um, but I think one of the main reasons why he is returning is because the time away from Formula One and trying new things has made him realise that there is no other motorsport quite like Formula One. That's very true. And I think um, because Emma has actually showed me the notes that she's prepared, and I must be completely honest with one of the points that we do need to get onto is the fact of the 2022 regulations. Because first of all, you've got someone who's returning, I think now for the third time to Enstone. Yes. After obviously uh, his first spell, where he won two world titles in 2005 and 2006 against the legend, yeah. is Michael Schumacher. And I don't mind saying the pronunciation correctly because a lot of people do get it wrong. It's like Nico Hülkenberg because there's an umlaut on top of the U. Um, but I think that I think from many respects, we've got to look at it from a Renault strategy point, haven't we? Because Cyril Abitable yeah. hasn't had the best run of luck. He needs to bring in somebody that will provide stability to the team but also to help push forward towards 2022 where things are going to be very very different in comparison to what we have now uh, in what is effectively the seventh year of the turbo hybrid era of formula one these days yeah yeah definitely and i think when you when you think about the whole decision and why it was made you've got to look at the pros and cons of why um renault are bringing him back um, and one of the, the pros that I completely agree with is that he's still a great driver. He's a very high profile driver, he's still a great driver. He's got a lot of experience of getting the best out of the car when it's underperforming. And Renault will rely on that because at the moment they're sitting in the midfield. We've had two Grand Prix so far this season and they've had two eight place finishes and two DNFs and their rivals are running away from them at this point in time. So they do need a really good, strong driver who will be able to take that development further. And obviously with everything being frozen for 2021 because of COVID-19 happening, you know, Renault's going to feel the pressure, aren't they? You know, it's a, it's a team that has been uh, at the sharp end of the field back in the mid-2000s, but then afterwards, Enstone and Viry Chetillon have not been the powerhouse that I think possibly a lot of people expected uh, since Alonso's departure to then partner Lewis Hamilton in 2007. Yeah. We all know what happened in not just the first era of Alonso at McLaren. We also found out about the GP2 engine. 
uh, yeah. clause <laughs> as well. And and that's one but of the we things... We will always remember the GP2 engine quote. We will always remember that. <laughs> and, then, and then they're just like, ah, afterwards on the mic, on, on, the, on the radio. But I think yeah. he, we know that there was an interesting uh, quotation from Matt Bishop, who worked with Fernando, uh, during Matt's time at uh, McLaren. And he said that, you know, I would brief Fernando. And it's like, you know, let's go through it. No, 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 I know everything. And we know from previous experience, it's happened at Ferrari, it's happened at McLaren. It could happen again at Renault, that if the car is not up to scratch, he is going to do the psych job on Cyril Abitable and go public on the radio. And that has happened before. And I think yeah. that's one of the things that could be uh, the other side of the double-edged blade that Renault are treading quite thinly on, because I don't think it's not just about Fernando Alonso. But let's look at Cyril Abitaboul. He is under pressure. Renault are not happy. They wanted, yeah. you know, they signed Daniel Ricciardo for a two-year lucrative deal with an option on a third. And... He saw how McLaren did last year and went, you know what? I think I actually should have jumped at the right opportunity. And now he's done it because Carlos Sainz has left in that opportunity. I think Cyril has been uh, typically um, bullish about how he's reacted to Daniel's departure to McLaren. But then also yeah. the fact you could see that there was a, a wry smile on his face knowing that we're going to have Fernando again. But then behind it, he was sort of like thinking, what if it doesn't go right? Yeah, there has been a lot of talk that Renault could potentially leave Formula One if their performance doesn't pick up. I know, as we've spoke about, the, the board aren't too happy with the performance at the moment. So there is that you know, huge amount of pressure put on the team to be able to get this partnership with uh, Alonso right. Um, you know, he's he's got to develop that car so when the changes do come in in 2022 it is competitive and it is running at the front again but that's just the thing if it doesn't go right it's going to ruin Alonso's career and everything's going to go wrong at Renault but then what about Esteban Ocon the other part of the partnership yeah. you know we, can't 20... forget about we cannot forget about <laughs> young Esteban I remember um, actually being in the DTM paddock when Esteban and Max Verstappen were competing in FIA Formula 3, the European Championship at that point, before it changed to uh, the effective feeder series for Formula 1. Um, Esteban was with Prima Power Team. He was a Mercedes junior. He ran with the Lotus junior team colours in that particular point in time. So even at 26 years of age, Esteban is very wise beyond his years. And I think he could learn a lot from Fernando, but also having... Um, and this reminds me of the early 1980s when Rene Arnoux and Alain Prost were with Renault back in the heyday when turbo engines came uh, thick and fast. And it has, it's, it has that sort of revitalization that I think the French manufacturer needs to have a young future world champion. I don't think, uh, you know, everyone was talking about Romain Grosjean. I think the, the person that France is really keeping their eyes on is Esteban Ocon. Yeah, definitely. He's really talented. Um, you know, I, I was really disappointed when he never got a Mercedes seat. Everyone thought that he was going to get that Mercedes seat, and I was really disappointed for him. I think he's a huge talent. He's the next rising star in Formula One. He has got so much potential. He can learn a lot from Alonso um, with the, the wealth of experience that Alonso will bring to a young driver like Ocon. However, his uh, Alonso's attitude and the way he will want to assert himself in that team as the alpha driver um, could potentially derail Ocon's development completely within the team. And you could start to see that tension that we had at McLaren with Alonso and Hamilton. So there is that danger as well. Yeah. So that's really about it for two of the Formula One drivers, Fernando Alonso yes. and Esteban Ocon. Now we go to the third one. And there have been rumours circulating like wildfire. And this oh, name needs no introduction. Four-time Formula One world <laughs> champion, Sebastian Vettel. What about him? Yeah, I have not taken any notes for this at all, Alex. So <laughs> everything that I'm saying is going to be my completely own opinion on this. And I am 
always outspoken about Sebastian Vettel. We, we, um, we, we have discussed this on many occasions, you and I, <laughs> uh, on mo- multiple phone calls, multiple chats on Facebook Messenger. Yeah. But I, I think the one point that I really want to bring up about Sebastian, I'm not going to talk about Ferrari, because as far as I'm concerned, yeah. that is water under the bridge. It's the what about yeah. Sebastian Vettel to possibly what could be a, a bit of a deal breaker for Aston Martin next year. Because there's uh, there's so much talk now that Lawrence Stroll, uh, Lance's daddy, yeah. wants to have a great team. You know, a great team. Um, people are saying that um, I've even seen comments quite literally today before we started recording this that Lance's heart wasn't in any sort of press engagement that he had at the steering Grand Prix. Um, and then there's also the caveat of a potential claws being exercised on Sergio Perez Mm -hmm. who brings a lot of significant sponsorship to the team uh through uh you know the the Mexican side of the uh, telecommunications but there's also rumors circulating about him possibly uh, announcing what he's going to do on August 2nd um but Sebastian Vettel to to uh, the team which will as of next year be formally known as Racing Point that's quite. That's gathered a lot of momentum in the last four days since uh, his faux pas going into uh, going up the inside of Carlos Sainz and, sh- and uh, you know and the, on on race one of the season, and then yeah. taking out his teammate on race two. <laughs> you know, it's know. Uh, it's quite interesting how the the chips have sort of fallen a little bit more in Sebastian's favour now that we got the. Uh, we got the confirmation from Binotto uh, saying that we did not feel it was right to extend his contract for 2021. Yeah, I felt really bad for the guy. I really, really did. It's, I'm not a Vettel fan. I never have been. However, when that was announced, you know, when he said in that press conference that a contract was not on the table for 2021, I was like, mate, you're breaking my heart here. This yeah. is like really really sad he's a four-time world champion he is a really really great driver I actually love Vettel off the track compared to what I do on the track Um, I think he's a chancer on the track but he's still a really really good driver he deserves to still be driving in Formula One in 2021 I think the notion of him going to do Aston Martin racing I think at the beginning when the rumors were going around it was considered to be, ah, you know, that'll that'll never happen. Um, It's kind of pie in the sky kind of thinking. Um, However, I think it was David Coulter that actually um, did an interview um, and said, actually, this this could be a really good partnership um, and a really good career step for Vettel. But I would like to see him driving an Aston Martin next year. Um, but at what expense? As you say, you've got Sergio Perez, who is on a multi-year contract. If they were to end it, they would have to um, use the exit clause in his contract. Um, it would be a shame to see Perez go. I think that um, he, you know, he was in McLaren too early. I think he's sitting his prime at the moment um, with Racing Point. And he, you, you can see the amount of passion that he still has for Formula One. You know, he he helped save the Force India team, which is now Racing Point. Um, he brings a lot of sponsorship money to the team as well. Um, and I think he's quite a good mentor for the younger drivers. Um, but I can't help but wonder what a Vettel and Perez partnership would look like. Um, you know, that is something that's quite exciting. But then you've got the other end of the spectrum where you've got you know, would Vettel partner Stroll? Um, my thoughts on that, and I think you know what I'm going to say, that boy will be in that team as long as his daddy is paying the money. Yes, but this is something I'm going to sort of slightly disagree on because let's not forget, Perez has been the standout. And I think that a Vettel-Perez combination in 2021 could actually really, really change things because when you think about it, Vettel is good friends with Toto Wolf. Toto Wolf has bought yeah. shares in Aston Martin. The, um, and Lawrence Stroll has led a, what, a £500 million consortium in order to actually take over Aston Martin. Uh, yeah. Andy Palmer is no longer CEO. He's been ousted. Uh, they've had one of the guys from AMG 
Uh, I think his, I know his first name is Tobias, but I can't remember his second name for the life of me. But imagine that though, a Vettel Perez Aston Martin super team in Formula One. That yeah. I think has got a lot more traction than say, and, and I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. I think that Lance, after his comments post Syria, Syrian Grand Prix, I think left a lot to be desired, and. What I look at it from a business acumen perspective, Sebastian Vettel, you know, it's a marquee name in Formula One. He yeah. hasn't won those four world titles by accident. And people say, and this is one of the things that I am a little bit critical about, but I think it is very, very just. Lewis, it's not just about the car. It is about the individual. I remember when I heard about how Sebastian Vettel went about getting his first world title when they changed to the Pirellis. From Bridgestone, Sebastian mm-hmm. was at Pirelli themselves in Italy at the headquarters, finding out so much information, and that is why he worked so well with Adrian Newey. Dietrich Mateschitz had, through Toro Rosso, now for, now well the team formerly known as uh, Toro Rosso, now known as Alpha Tauri, um, uh, and it, that's really really made things quite interesting because I think that okay. Better was asked, if, if Red Bull offered you a seat, would you take it? His answer was yes. He's still close with Dietrich Mateschitz, who is the, the CEO of the company. But Helmut yeah. Marko have said no. Christian Horner have said no. But there have been some rumours circulating around that Alex Albon needs to improve. So yeah. that opens another door for somebody else. Um, but I think that's going to attract more sponsors for Aston Martin. Uh, F1 in 2021. Oh, I so, prefer driver like Sebastian, definitely. But then you then you add the one plus one equation making two. Mercedes engines, well, Mercedes power units, I keep on saying engines. Uh, power units, gearboxes, suspension. Who's not to say that this could open the door that Sebastian Vessel has been waiting for? A potential to maybe, in a, for a couple of years, yeah. at a stage of his career, to go to Mercedes, that could happen. Yeah. So you look at it from a, a sort of like a, a domino effect. And I could see that if Vettel gets confirmed, apparently Mexican media have now said that Perez will announce something on August 2nd, which is the, <laughs> which is quite exciting because that is actually the British Grand Prix weekend. It's quite convenient as well because that's literally two days after his exit clause would have been <laughs> sorted out. So that is that is quite interesting. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I, I think that really covers that on on uh, the uh, Sebastian Vettel side of things. Obviously, there is a lot of circulation about what's going on in Formula One. We're not going to bore you with everything, but we wanted to, on what about, really talk to you about a couple of things. But there is one more thing. Uh, well, it, there's actually, uh, what about we race as one? in Formula One. And there has been a defining moment on the podium at the Styrian Grand Prix. Because uh, for those looking at my smartphone, there is a lady by the name of Stephanie that is part of Mercedes AMG Petronas Motorsports F1 team. And she was the first ever woman of black origin to be on the podium. She has been an integral part of that team. She actually got through the uh, a Pet- Petronas Initiative Petronas is still very much a title sponsor of Mercedes in Formula One. But with we're not going to get onto the kneeling side of things. We are talking about a halcyon moment uh, in the in, in this in this side of thing. And Emma, to see it's not just a person of black descent, but it's also a woman as well. So it is showing that everything that Lewis Hamilton is believing in is coming thick and front to the fore, irrespective of the naysayers, because we here at Downforce Racing, we are unbiased. We do not, we believe in the strength of the individual, not the color of their skin, not their religious beliefs, not their sexual orientation, uh, who they are, what their past history is. As long as we recognize that they are a human being, and you can see why Sky Sports F1, quite recently on Twitter, actually today, in fact, on Wednesday, Simon Lazenby and Karun Chandok have preached it. And people are saying that politics and Formula One do not mix. It has been inherent 
in Formula One, wouldn't you agree, Emma? For, for so long, oh, yeah. since um, Ballest, Ecclestone, it's even happening today in the Liberty Media era. But to see Stephanie end up on the podium, I think was something so, um, so effervescent, you know, such a joyous occasion that Lewis called her and said, you're coming to the podium with me. And I bet the first yeah. thing that she was thinking was like, this is a defining moment for us all here in Formula One. Yeah, I mean, he he really praised her on his social media channels as well, um, saying that, you know, she is such an inspiration for, for women who work in motorsport to see how far you can actually go, um, which I completely agree with. We all know that, you know, it is quite difficult um, for a woman to get into a career in motorsport but you know having her standing on that podium is is just an inspiration to young women and to girls everywhere um, who want to either be a race driver want to be an engineer who wants to be a journalist um, it was just an inspiration to see her up there and I'm so glad and um, in this current climate that, that we'd be, be able to have a, a woman on the podium um, so yeah, it was a really nice moment. But it was also, I was reading a lot of comments on social media about her being there. Um, a lot of fans had started a conversation about it, and her mum was actually commenting on on all of these posts and saying, you know, that's my daughter, that's my daughter, mm -hmm. and it was such a proud moment for them as well. So you know, I really hope that we see more of that um, in Formula One. Yes, um, I, I completely concur on that, Emma. I mean, we've known each other for. I think since I've known uh, your husband, Tom, uh, you know, for quite a time now. And myself and Emma, we've worked together in the DTM paddock last year at Browns Hatch, where, you know, it's the W Series finale. It was Emma's first media assignment. And now, you know, you're doing Formula One, you're doing W Series. Uh, you're doing uh, now taking charge of our social media here at, at yeah. Downforce Racing. And for anyone that sort of like says to me, you know, why do you think people should be I, I, about an opportunities engine? And this is something that we, myself and Jake, have talked about here at Downforce Racing. And if you do want to get involved, fire me an email directly at dfukcommunications at gmail.com uh, and give us an idea of what you want to look at, what, whether you want to cover the British touring cars or anything like that. But Emma, a lot has changed um, since your first media assignment. And I know for a fact you're... You're chomping, you're raring to, to, to go at the bit to, to get back into the paddock. And just tell those people out there how difficult it is from a perspective from a woman trying to get into motorsport. It is not that easy at all, is it? It's not. It really isn't. I mean, I am so grateful for the opportunity that, that you and Jake had given me to, to start writing it down for us. I mean, I... I don't have any sort of journalism qualifications. I'm a girl that studied retailing at university. You know, I'm a shopkeeper. Um, that's my day job. But my, um, my passion has always been um, Formula One. And um, with the growth of W Series as well, which has been absolutely fantastic, watching that grow from an idea into reality and actually being there in the paddock um, has been absolutely amazing. Now, as I said, it's, I mean, motorsport is a big passion of mine. Um, I seem to have just this talent for, for writing. And um, I remember I emailed you and Jake and kind of said, I can write, can you give me a job? Yeah. <laughs> and that was, um, <laughs> that, was, um, that was kind of how it went. And um, I haven't really looked back. It's, it's been one thing after another. Opportunities um, have, have arisen and that's all been down to the fact that I've had um, people like yourself and Jake believe in the quality of my work, even when I've not believed in it sometimes. And um, as long as you're pushing really, really hard, um, then you'll, you'll get there. I mean, I never thought I'd be in the paddock at W Series talking to all those drivers and actually interviewing them. And I think I had a conversation with you at the time when I said, I'm not really confident at doing interviews. Um, you know, I've never done this before. I'm actually quite nervous. And you were like, look, Emma, you'll be fine. You'll be absolutely fine. Um, I did get a little bit starstruck. I met Ted Kravitz in the paddock. I remember yep. we all had that um, conversation. Let's go and find Ted Kravitz so Emma can talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I, I, yeah, that, that, was, that was a brilliant weekend. I mean, myself and Emma were sitting next to each other in the Browns Hatch Media Centre. Um, and I, uh, what was it? I was 
catch. I was actually catching up with Will Buxton of all people. Will had flown all the way back uh, from Philadelphia. He'd done a book signing and a Q and A. He was jet lagged to hell. He was on the non-alcoholic beer. I can tell you that much. <laughs> um, and I remember him just. You could see how exhausted he was. But then along comes the very bouncy and bubbly uh, Vicky Peria. You know, who managed to get through. I think she finished like P eleven at the end of the season. Um, and like there were there was the biggest grin I've ever seen on an Italian woman in all my life, and it just so happened to be Vicky. And I and I followed Vicky's career for so long, and just to actually be there when she and Will were talking, and it was just great because you sometimes you have to sort of sit back and listen, and sometimes it's better to listen because you can just sort of like go. I think he's got a drive for 2020 and she doesn't have to put her hand in her pocket. So, yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. but I mean, one of the big things about Emma was sort of like, I said, well, we, we were sort of tag teaming, weren't we? I wasn't, wasn't <laughs> doing any interviews, but I remember going upstairs into the W series hospitality and I was there with Sarah Moore, Claire Cotting and Alice Powell, Caitlin Wood, um, and quite a few others, and I had really good chats with with Matt as well. And it was really good to see that Matt's doing such great work with with W Series along with Catherine Von Muir. But there is one dream that you have above all to get into a particular paddock. Is that right, my dear? Yes, I want to get into Formula One paddock. I don't really care what track it is, as long as I get. There. <laughs> um, I, I would I would really love to do that. Um, you know, it's it's something that I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, now that I've had the the taste of it, being in the W Series paddock, um, you you know you just naturally you just want more and you aim higher and higher. So the the aim is to get into a Formula One paddock as press, um, and to be able to interview drivers. Um, so that is the dream, and that's I'm trying really hard um, to get there. Um, so you know, with the help of Downforce, it's it's been it's been a joy, and you know, I'm so I'm amazed at how many people are reading my work now, how many people are sharing it, um, and um, the reach is, is has been incredible, and it just goes to show that like when you're, you know, sometimes you just can't sit back and wait yeah. for the opportunities to come to you. You have to go out searching for them, and that's what I did, um, and um, and here we are. Yeah, here we are on the first edition of What About Here on Downforce Racing. Big thank you to you, Emma, for joining me on uh, this first of hopefully many guest appearances from your good self. I think next time we'll have to definitely talk yeah. about W Series. But on behalf of Emma Butterworth and myself, Alex Goldschmidt, it's goodbye from our first edition of What About. And see you in a couple of weeks where I'll have another special guest talking about another particular category. Thank you for watching. Have a great one. And above all, stay safe out there.